Добрый вечер, и я счастлива представить человека, который приехал специально для того, чтобы выступить на, на, в рамках начатого культа важного, мне кажется, проекта, написанного в Америке. Это Июнь Ли. Ее знают в Штатах как прозаика, автора короткой прозы, автора романов, человека, получившего массу литературных премий, и совсем не знают в России. И, собственно, когда я готовилась представлять ее, я искала э, переведенные тексты Юнь Ли и нашла один недоступный онлайн, насколько могу судить, очень старый, очень давно переведенный текст в журнале иностранной литературы незапамятных времен. И вот недавно опубликованный перевод в журнале «Сноп». Нашла интервью, которое делал с ее Илья Данишевский, прекрасный писатель и издатель, и больше ничего. И мне кажется, в этом смысле Кольта совершила фантастически правильный жест, потому что писателей, которых мы знаем, писателей, которые у нас, которых у нас переводят, с ними есть две тонкости. Одна тонкость — их кто-нибудь привезет. Рано или поздно мы увидим этих людей живем, поговорим с ними живьем. Для этого не так важно организовывать отдельный интеллектуальный проект. А второй нюанс кажется мне более существенным в сегодняшней лекции. Когда мы знаем человека по текстам, когда мы хорошо знакомы с его работой, у нас есть призма. У нас есть что-то вроде матового стекла, уже затуманенного нашим собственным восприятием, через которое мы смотрим на него как на живое существо, через которое мы пропускаем его тексты. Здесь совершается некоторым образом культурный перформанс, на мой взгляд. Это когда издание ставит на кон свою репутацию и говорит, дорогие друзья, вам придется поверить нам на слово. Этот человек заслуживает того, чтобы на него посмотреть и его услышать. И вот люди, которые пришли вчера в библиотеку Достоевского, большинство из них не читало текст в Юнь совсем, и это не мудрено. И люди, которые пришли сегодня сюда, может быть, читали ее рассказ, может быть, кто-то читал ее работу на английском, но, уверенно, здесь наверняка есть и те, кто не знаком с ее творчеством, кто пришел на культурное явление, а не посмотреть, как выглядит то, чьи слова нам важны. Мне кажется, что это очень важная история, очень важный прецедент и очень важная ситуация, очень важный сюжет про культурные репутации, и мне потрясающе дорого видеть, что он сработал. И Юн — человек, который вчера на э, круглом столе в библиотеке Достоевского рассказывал нам много про то, как устроена его идентичность. Собственно, весь вчерашний круглый стол оказался об идентичности. И мы, среди прочего, спрашивали ее, и им рассказывала о том, каково быть человеком, которому всегда переписывают идентичность. Ей переписывают идентичность китаянки, ей переписывают идентичность человека, переехавшего из Китая в Америку, ей переписывают идентичность человека, очередной язык китайский, человека который стал писать на английском, у человека, который растит своих детей, не знающих китайского, и много-много-много других идентичностей, не давая ей возможность конструировать свою собственную. Я знаю, какую лекцию, какое выступление приготовила для нас сегодня июнь. Я пытаюсь сделать э, ту вещь, о которой июнь, видимо, как мне показалось вчера, часто просит своих читателей, и которые мы все, как люди, привыкшие очень по-своему обращаться с писателем, по-своему обращаться с книжками, не позволяем ей. Я попытаюсь не приписывать ей эти идентичности, насколько это возможно, понимаю все лукавство этой игры, но я попробую, и не представлять ее совсем. Я попытаюсь сказать вам, вот человек, чьи тексты значат очень много, и то, что он собирается рассказать нам, ценно, не потому, где он родился, на каком языке он пишет, а какие премии он получил. Это ценно потому, что это довольно выдающийся текст. Пожалуйста, послушайте его. Я приглашаю Юн Ли, чтобы она рассказала нам об этом. Uh, 
Well, good evening. Thank you so much for coming and for that beautiful, beautiful introduction. And thank you, Kalta and Pan, for bringing me here. It's extraordinary. I have had a few extraordinary days here in the past few days. And I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit about language and writing. And I do you mind if I sit down? Sit down. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to we to talk a little, and then we're we're going to have a conversation. Some of the earliest literary education, some of the, my earliest literary education came from a set of illustrated autobiography of Maxim Gorky. The three book, my childhood, in the world, my university were abridged and supplemented with vivid ink drawings. Palm-sized, this illustrated publication were called little people's books at the time, though they were not children's books. It was a literary format that had made Shen Song Wen, one of my most favorite Chinese writers, lament the loss of literature in communist China. Even an illiterate person could flip through these books, just as I had started reading Gorky's autobiography before I had learned any Chinese characters. As a small person, though, I had obtained endless pleasure from these three books, my own possession, and I owned very little. There was not a single dull page Gorky's grandfather beating his grandmother, his stepfather kicking his mother, his uncles convincing a kind-hearted young man to carry a heavy cross to the graveyard and watching him crushed to death without any remorse, Gorky being clubbed as an apprentice. Deaths happened every few pages. His father, his brother, his mother, a young man with consumption who used to hum melancholy tunes friends and neighbors and strangers. The book's messages, hardships, inequalities, Gorky's political awakening, all these were lost to me. What entertained me were the range of characters, rag pickers, rich relatives, sailors, townspeople, priests, icon painters, shop owners, longshoremen, widows, prostitutes, beggars, a one-armed one man, a blind man, a cook who cried over the beauty of poetry, a beautiful woman who loaned Gorky books, a tyrannical bakery owner, mourning his pigs poisoned by his hired hand. Recently, I reread the autobiography. What a strange introduction to Russian literature, beginning with Gorky. Beginning with Gorky feels like climbing on top of a bungalow, not, no, not realizing nearby there's the, there's the Great Wall of China. The book sustained many of my recollections, though this time the author's self-dramatization struck me as unpretentiously juvenile. Is it fair to wish for Gorky autobiography without Gorky? Still, I could recognize the allure of the books to a child. The orphan seems to be able to go through a life that aims, that maims and defeats others, but always leave him on a center stage, more elevated and heroic and charismatic with each adventure. There's no time to be wasted between one drama and the next. In fact, there's no life to be lived between dramas. But it can be Gorky's fault. Each era gives people their language and use of language. When I was young, my parents and their generation often sang the songs from their youth, Katusha, Moscow Night, The Hawthorn Tree, Blooming Red Berries. Some of them sang in Russian, others sang in Chinese translation. One of my early childhood memories, mystifying, was to see all these uncles and aunts in chorus, accompanied by someone wildly pumping the accordion. Of course, now I understand their passion. During the 1950s and 1960s, 
Any Chinese song that had any emotional beauty was called bourgeois, or even poisonous. The songs that were unscathed by the ideological scrubbing were the Russian songs. And my parents' generation had those songs to sing, what they did not have in Chinese. The topic of language has been on my mind as a writer, and a writer in second language. There's a, piece from, there's a piece from my recent book that explored the relationships between public language and private language, between native language and adoptive language, and between language and history, both public and private. So the title of this piece is called To Speak is to Blunder, but I want you. But I want you. In a dream the other night, I was back in Beijing at the entrance of our apartment complex, where a public telephone, a black rotary, had once been guarded by the old women from the neighborhood association. They used to listen without hiding their disdain or curiosity while I was on the phone with friends. When I finished, they would complain about the length of the conversation before locking it into their book and calculating the change. In those days, I gathered many chores before I went to use the telephone, lest my parents notice my extended absence. My allowance, which was what I could scrimp and save from my lunch money, was spent on phone calls and stamps and envelopes. Like a Victorian character, I checked out our mail before my parents and intercepted letters written to me. In my dream, I asked for the phone. Two women came out of the office. I recognized them. In real life, they are both gone. No, they said, the service is no longer offered because everyone has a cell phone these days. There was nothing particular about the dream. A melancholy visit to the past in this manner is beyond one's control but for the fact that the women spoke to me in English. Years ago, when I started writing in English, my husband, my husband asked if I understood the implication of the decision. What he meant was not the practical concerns, though there were plenty. The nebulous hope of getting published, the lack of career paths as had been laid out in science, my first field of postgraduate study in America, the harsher immigration regulation I would face as a fiction writer. Many of my college classmates from China, as scientists, acquired their green cards and their national interest waiver. An artist is not of much importance to any nation's interest. My husband, who writes computer programs with codes, was asking about language. Did I understand what it meant to renounce my mother tongue? Nabokov once answered a question he must have been tired of being asked. My private tragedy, which cannot, indeed should not be anyone's concern, is that I had to abandon my natural language. That something is called a tragedy, however, means it's no longer personal. One weeps out of private pains but only when the audience swarms in and claims understanding and empathy do they call it a tragedy. One's grief belongs to oneself, one's tragedy to others. I often feel a tinge of guilt when I imagine Nabokov's wall. Like all intimacies, the intimacy between one and one's mother tongue can be comforting and irreplaceable, yet it can also demand what more than what one is willing to give, or more than one is capable of giving. If I allow myself to be honest, my private salvation, which cannot and should not be anyone's concern, is that I disowned my native language. In the summer and autumn of 2012, I was hospitalized in California and in New York for suicide attempts. During that period, my dreams often took me back to Beijing. I would be standing on top of a building 
one of those gray Soviet-style apartments, or I would be lost on a bus traveling through an unfamiliar neighborhood. Waking up from those dreams, I would list in my journal images that did not appear in my dreams, as well as nest underneath a balcony, the barbed wires at the rooftop, the garden where old people sat and exchanged gossip, the mailboxes at the street corners, round green, covered by dust with handwritten collection times behind a square window of hot, opaque plastic. Yet I've never dreamed of Iowa City, where I first landed in America. When asked about my initial impression of the place, I cannot excavate anything from memory to form a meaningful answer. During a recent trip there from my home in California, I visited a neighborhood that I used to walk through every day. The one-story houses, which were painted in pleasantly muted colors, with gardens in the front endorsed by white picket fences, had now changed. I realized that I had never described them to others or to myself in Chinese. And when English was established as my language, they had become everyday mundanities. What happened during my transition from one language to another did not become memory. People often ask about my decision to write in English. The switch from one language to another feels natural to me, I reply. So that does not say much just as one can hardly give a convincing explanation as to why someone's hair turns gray on this day but not on the other. But this is an inane analogy because I do not want to touch the heart of the matter. Yes, there is something unnatural which I have refused to accept. Not the fact of writing in a second language, there are always Nabokov and Conrad as references, and many of my contemporaries as well. Nor that I impulsively give up a reliable career for writing. It's the absoluteness of my abandonment of Chinese, undertaken with such determination that it is a kind of suicide. The tragedy of Nabokov's loss is that his misfortune was easily explained by public history. His story of being driven by a revolution into permanent exile became other people's possession. My decision to write in English has also been explained as a flight from my country's history. But unlike Nabokov, who had been a Russian writer, I never wrote in Chinese. Still, one cannot avoid that a private decision, once seen through a public prism, becomes a metaphor. Once a poet of East European origin and I, we both have lived in America for years, and we both write in English, were asked to read our own work in our, own, in our native language at a gala. But I don't write in Chinese, I explained. And the organizer apply, uh, apologized for his understanding, misunderstanding. I offered to read Li Po or Du Fu or any of the Asian poets I had grown up memorizing. But instead, it was arranged for me to read poetry by a political prisoner. A metaphor's desire to transcend diminish any human story. It's a ambition to illuminate blinds those who create metaphors. In my distrust of metaphors, I feel a kinship to George Eliot. We, all of us, grave or light, get our thoughts entangled in metaphors and act fatally on the strengths of them. This, I know, is what my husband was questioning years ago. But my abandonment of my first language is personal, so deeply personal that I resist any interpretation, political or historical or ethnographical. Chinese immigrants of my generation in America criticizes my English for not being native enough. 
a compatriot, after reading my work, emailed, pointing out how my language is neither lavish nor lyrical as a real writer's language should be. You only write simple things in simple English. You should be ashamed of yourself, he wrote in the fury. A professor, an American writer in graduate school, told me that I should stop writing, as English would remain a foreign language to me. Their concerns about ownership of a language, rather than making me impatient as an abacal, allows me secret laughter. English is to me as random a choice as any other language. What one goes toward is less definitive than that from which one turns away. Before I left China, I destroyed the journal that I had kept for years and most of the letters written to me. Those same letters I had once watched out for, lest my mother discovered them. What I could not bring myself to destroy, I sealed up and brought with me to America, though they are never to be opened again. My letter to, to others I would have destroyed too had I had them. This constant and violent desire to erase a life lived in a native language is only wishful thinking. One's relationship with the native language is similar to that with the past. Rarely does a story start where we wish it had, or end where we wish it would. One crosses the border to become a new person. One finishes a manuscript and cuts out the characters. One adopts a language. These are false and forced frameworks, providing illusory freedom. At times provides illusory leniency when we, in anguish, let it pass monotonously. To kill time, an English phrase that still chills me, time can be killed, but only by frivolous matters and purposeless activities. No one thinks of suicide as a courageous endeavor to kill time. During my second hospital stay in New York, a group of nursing students came to play bingo on a Friday night. A young woman, a fellow patient, asked me if I would join her. Bingo, I said. I have never in my life played that. She pondered for a moment and said she had only played bingos in the hospital. It was her eighth hospitalization when I met her. She had been schooled for a while in the hospital when she had been younger. And once, she pointed out a small patch of a fence in green where she and other children had been let out for exercise. Often, her father visited her in the afternoon, and I would watch them sitting together, playing a game, not attempting a conversation. By then, all words must have been inadequate, language doing little to help a mind survive time. Yet language is capable of sinking a mind. One's thoughts are slavishly bound to language. I used to think an abyss is a moment of despair becoming interminable. But any moment, even the direst, is bound to end. What's abysmal is that one's erratic language closes in on one as quicksand. We can kill time, but language kills us. Patience stated that she felt like a burden to the loved ones. Much later, I read the notes from the emergency room. I did not have any recollection of the conversation. A burden to loved ones, this language must have been provided to me. I would never use the phrase in my thinking or my writing. But my resistance has little to do with avoiding a platitude. To say a burden is to grant oneself weight in other people's lives. To call them loved ones is to fake one's ability to love. One does not always want to be subject to self-interrogation imposed by a cliché. When Catherine Mansfield, and she's a, a New Zealand writer that I constantly read, uh, when Catherine Mansfield was still a teenager in New Zealand, she wrote in her journal about a man next door playing for weeks on a cornet, Swanee River. I wake up with the Swanee River, eat 
it with every meal I take, and go to bed eventually with all the world am sad and weary as a lullaby. I read Mansfield's notebooks and Marianne Moore's letters. Marianne Moore is an American, most American poet that I love, early 20th century. I read Mansfield's notebooks and Marianne Moore's letters around the same time when I returned home from New York. Moore, in a letter, described a night of fundraising grandma, maidens in bathing suits and green bathing tails on a raft. It was really most realistic, way down upon the Swanee River. I marked the entries because they reminded me of a moment I had forgotten. I was nine and my sister thirteen. On a Saturday afternoon, I was in our apartment and she was on the balcony. My sister had joined the middle school choir that year, and in the autumn sunshine, she sang in a voice that was beginning to leave girlhood. Way down upon the Swanee River, far, far away. That's where my heart is turning ever. That's where the old folks stay. The lyrics were in Chinese. The memory, too, should be in Chinese. But I cannot see our tiny garden with the grapevine, which our father cultivated and was later uprooted by our wrathful mother or the bamboo fence dotted with morning glory, or the junk that occupied half the balcony, years of accumulation piled high by our hoarder of father, if I do not name these things to myself in English. I cannot see my sister, but I can hear her sing in the lyrics in English. I can seek to understand my mother's vulnerability and cruelty, by the clinical terms in DSM-5. The DSM is this big uh, manual of uh, diagnosis of uh, mental illness in America. It's the fifth edition. But language is the barrier I have chosen. Memories left untranslated can be disowned. Memories untranslatable can become someone else's story. Over the years, my brain has banished Chinese. I dream in English, I talk to myself in English. And memories, not only those about America, but also those about China, not only those carried with me, but also those archived with the wish to forget, are sorted in English. To be orphaned from my native language felt and still feels like a crucial decision. When we enter a world, a new country, a new school, a party, a family, or a class reunion, an army camp, a hospital, we speak the language it requires. The wisdom to adapt is the wisdom to have two languages, the one spoken to others and the one spoken to oneself. One learns to master the public language, not much different from the way that one acquires a second language assess the situations, construct sentences with the right words and the correct syntax, catch mistakes if one can avoid it, or else apologize and learn the lesson after a blunder. Fluency in the public language, like fluency in the second language, can be achieved with enough practice. Perhaps the line between the two is and should be fluid. It is never so for me. I often forget when I write that English is also used by others. English is my private language. Every word has to be pondered over before it becomes a word. I have no doubt, can this be an illusion, that the conversation I have with myself, however in linguistically flawed, is the conversation that I have always wanted in the exact way I want it to be. In my relationship with English, in this relationship with the intrinsic distance between a non-native speaker and adopted language that makes people look as kings, I feel invisible, but not estranged. It is the position I believe I always want in life. But with every pursuit, there's the danger of crossing a line from invisibility to erasure. 
There was a time I could write well in Chinese. In school, my essays were used as models. In the army, so I, I talk a little bit about I was in Chinese army for a year. In the army, uh, where I spent a year of involuntary service between the age of 18 and 19, our squad leader gave me the choice between drafting a speech for her and cleaning the toilets or the pigsties. I always chose to write. Once in high school, I entered an oratory contest. On stage, I saw that many of the listeners were moved to tears by the poetic and insincere lies I had made up. I moved myself to tears, too. That I could become a successful propaganda writer crossed my mind. I was disturbed by this. A young person wants to be true to herself and to the world, but what did not occur to me then was to ask, can one's intelligence rely entirely on the public language? Can one form a precise thought, record an accurate memory, or even feel a genuine feeling with only the public language? My mother, who loves to sing, often sings the songs from her childhood and youth, many of them words of propaganda from the 1950s and 60s. But there's one song she was there's one song she has reminisced about all her life because she does not know how to sing it. She learned the song in kindergarten, the year communism took over her hometown. She can only remember the opening line. There was an old woman in the hospital who sat in the hallway with a pair of shiny red shoes. I feel like Dorothy, she said as she showed me the shoes, which she had chosen from the donations to to patients. Some days her mind was lucid, and she would talk about the red shoes that hurt her feet, but she would not part with, or the medication that made her brain feel dead and left her body in pain. Other days, she talked to the air and ended this conversation with the end scene. People who had abandoned her by going away or dying returned and made her weep. I often sat next to this lonesome Dorothy. Was I eavesdropping? Perhaps. But her conversation was beyond encroachment. That one could reach a point where the border between public and private language no longer, no longer matters is frightening. Much of what one does to avoid suffering, to seek happiness, to, to stay healthy, is to keep a safe space for one's private language. Those who have lost that space has only, have only one language left. My grandmother, according to my mother and her siblings, had become a woman who talked to the unseen before she was sent to the asylum to die. There's so much to give up, hope, freedom, dignity. A private language, however, defies any confinement. Death alone can take it away. Mansfield spoke of her habit of keeping a journal as being garrulous. I must say anything affords me the same relief. Several times she directly addressed the readers her posterity in a taunting manner. I would prefer to distrust her, but it would be dishonest not to acknowledge the solace of reading them. It was in the immediate weeks after the second hospitalization. My life was on hold. There were diagnoses to grapple with, medications and protocols to implement, hospital staff to report to. But they were only there to eliminate an option. What to replace it with, I could not see. But I knew it was not within anyone's capacity to answer that. Not having the exact language for the bleakness I, feel, I felt, I devoured Mansfield's words like like thirst crunching poison. Is it possible that one can be held hostage by someone else's words? What I underlined and reread, are they her thoughts or mine? So I'm going to read a few lines. They're all Catherine Mansfield's words. There's nothing to do but work. But how can I work when this awful weakness makes even the pen like a walking stick? There's something profound and terrible in this eternal desire to establish contact. 
It is astonishing how violently a big branch shakes when a silly little bird had left it. I'd expect the bird knows it and feels immensely arrogant. One only wants to feel sure of another, that's all. I realize my faults better than anyone else could realize them. I know exactly where I fail. Have people, apart from those faraway people, ever existed for me? Or have they always failed me and faded because I denied them reality? Supposing I were to die, as I sit at this table, playing with my Indian paper knife, what would be the difference? No difference at all. Then why don't I commit suicide? So that's the end of her quote. When one thinks in adopted language, one arranges and rearranges words that are neutral, indifferent even. When one remembers in an adopted language, there's a dividing line in that remembrance. What came before could be someone else's life. It might as well be fiction. What language, I wonder, does one use to feel? What does one need the language to feel? In the hospital in New York, I visited a class of medical students studying minds and brains. After an interview, the doctor who led the class asked about feelings. I said it was beyond my ability to describe what might as well be indescribable. If you can't be articulate about your thoughts, why can't you articulate your feelings, the doctor asked. It took me a year to figure out the answer. It is hard to feel in an adopted language, yet it is impossible to do that in my native language. Often I think that writing is a futile effort, so is reading, so is living. Loneliness is the inability to speak with another in one's private language. That emptiness is filled with public language or, or romanticized connections. After the dream of the public telephone, I remember the moment in the army. It was New, York's, it was New Year's Eve, and we were ordered to watch an official celebration on CCTV. Halfway through the program, a girl on duty came and said there was a long distance call for me. It was the same type of black rotary as we had back at the apartment complex, and my sister was on the phone. It was the first long distance call I had received in my life, and the next time would be four years later, back in Beijing, when an American officer phoned to interview me. I still remember the woman calling from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City, asking questions about my interest in immunology, talking about her research project and life in America. My English was good enough to understand half of what he, she said, and the scratching noises in the background made me sweat for the missed half. Yet, what did my sister and I talk about on that New Year's Eve? In abandoning my native language, I have erased myself from that memory. But the erasing I have learned does not stop with a new language. And that, my friend, is my sorrow and my selfishness. In speaking and in writing an adopted language, I have not stopped erasing. I've crossed the line too, from erasing myself to erasing others. I am now the only casualty in this war against myself. In an ideal world, I would prefer to have my mind reserved for thinking and thinking alone. I dread the moment when a thought trails off and a feeling starts, when one faces the eternal challenge of eluding the void for which one does not have words. To speak when one cannot is to speak when one cannot is to blunder. I have spoken by heaven written this piece or any piece, this book or any book, for myself and against myself. The solace is with the language I chose, the grief to have spoken at all. Thank you very much. Спасибо.
трассе Бэйюнь. И э, у нас есть время на вопросы и ответы, и я хочу, если можно, начать с собственного, с, с одного небольшого комментария и одного очень важного лично для меня э, вопроса. Юни рассказывает о том, как э, ее родители пели советские песни, потому что в них было больше лирики, больше живого чувства, чем в тех текстах, которые было дозволено. I'll, I'll say to you. Uh, Oh, it's okay. So, so I'll speak English, and, and the translator can, can translate to, to the group. Um, you told us how your parents were singing Soviet semi-official songs, but actually songs that we perceived as official, songs that we, is, that we all, uh, often perceived as, well, part of propaganda, because they were a little bit more lyrical than uh, the song you were allowed to, to sing. <laughs> And I wanted to tell you that um, some of these songs, some of the songs you named, were written actually more than a hundred years ago. And some songs, for example, were written during the World War II. And I have to tell you that one of, of the things that always makes my, my heart turn around is that as soon as we get drunk, we sing those songs. We are so much not the Soviet peoples. Many of us are anti-Soviet people. But probably that, in some ways, that's a native lyrical language our hearts still speak. And that's both touching and horrifying. So thank you for, for adding a little bit to this very strange uh, mind space of ours. Um, you, you, there was one specific word in your um, essay that made me uh, wish to ask you. You said, one adopts a language. I know that's proper English. This is, this is the way you, you describe turning from one language to another. But the word adopts is meaningful. When you adopt something, someone, a pet, a child, you actually swear to love it as if it was your own. Did it work? That's such a, you, you just, wow, well, well, you just got the most important word from <laughs> that. <laughs> from that when, while you were talking and I was thinking, wow, maybe it's not I adopted the language, maybe it's that the language adopted me. Okay. Yes, but when, when I, Think about my adopting the language. Yes, I absolutely think it's it, think of English, my adopted language, as the most important thing in my, you know, thinking life, in my intellectual life. But you're right. The language is bigger than I am. The language claims everybody who uses it. So, so maybe I should say I am also adopted by this language, and 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 this is a language that has been welcoming throughout history and many other writers come to the language yeah you come to the language too thank you um, and um when we if, if we speak about adopting something we know that in the modern world you're supposed to tell the adoptee honey you're adopted but we love you as our own so if you play with this metaphor long enough probably the people who write to you this language doesn't sound as your native one. You have the whole right to say it's adopted and it knows it. So yes, it's it's well. When you asked that, I thought, okay, there's also the second conflict. Is you know you can be an adopted parent, but you can still have your own child. And in this incident, by adopting one language, I actually abandoned another language. Um, I, I, but probably if you feel it so heavily, you didn't abandon it, you just got ties, which is maybe not the same. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's I, I never really, I'm not sure, because especially when I hear you yesterday, I mean, you, you talk about, depending on situations, you will have different languages in your head, and, and I don't, I only think in English. And I wonder if that's just a willful 
in a way to to be less natural than you are. I'm sure there are situations in my life that requires my thinking in Chinese, but somehow I switch it all and by will. No freaking clue, but they'll think about it now. <laughs> uh, um, you said at some point that you, you, I, I read the Russian translation, so I don't know which word you, you, I, I don't remember which word you use in English, but you spoke about puppet language, the common language. You, you said not common, something else. Pub public language. Yes, but yeah. before that you said it was a social language, a societal language, a common language. Which, which word did you use? I, I think I might have used official, official language. Official language. Official language. Official language. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, uh, in Russian culture, as you probably know, there is a whole, um, there was a whole uh, line of authors who used, who, who reappropriated this official language and turned it into high poetry and high um, and high prose. And I remember myself as a Soviet child, and I remember it, at some age, starting, I guess, at the age of 11 or 12. When you could, at official, at official moments, uh, for example, we had a thing called political information, when you have to stand in front of the whole class and report on the news from the Soviet papers. God knows why, probably that was making us a bit, a bit better, better Soviet people, I don't know. But you felt how easy it was, how amazingly easy it was to appropriate this language, and you could speak in it as if it was foreign language that you grew in. I, 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 as if it, it, as if you were bilingual in a way, you had normal language and official language, and you could switch and start speaking in this official, God knows what, for for hours. You just didn't feel it, and and then suddenly you see puppet language. You you said that when you were a child, when you spoke this puppet language, at some moment at the the contest, you you felt impressed yourself, you, you could, and you knew that it in a way is a test. Yes. You could. Did you ever feel that this widely open, very easy to take way is a possibility to go through the official language, to adopt the official language? Because I, I know how attractive it can be. You know, it's interesting because I was actually, I want to tell this little an anecdote. It's not about communist official language, it's actually an American official language. I was at Cornell University giving a lecture and, and the guy who invited me, he said when he was six or seven, they were, I mean, these were American kids and the teacher would give them this assignment, say, write down three wishes. If you could wish for anything in the world, write three wishes you wanted. And he said, he wrote, all the chocolate I could eat, all the TV I could watch, all the free time I could have. And he said, and then everybody was supposed to go on stage to read your wishes. And he said, all these little stupid boys, they went on, <laughs> they, all the little stupid boys, like including me, we went on stage and said, oh, I wish for chocolate, I wish for this. And then he said, at one point, one girl went on up there and said, I wish for the world peace. I wish there were never war in the world again. And he said, that was the moment he realized he made the biggest mistake in his life. He was like, that's the language you should be using at school when you were asking to do that. So you were right. I think that language, there's a moment you learn that language and you realize you have to speak that language. And it is attractive. And and I I think it's attractive because from in my case it's it's so easy. It is very easy. You can use it just as fluently as your you know mother tongue, even more fluent than mother tongue because you do not have to think. So I think to you have to consciously estrange or distance yourself. Even today, I hate to, sometimes I hate to speak Chinese to my husband because I could hear my propaganda language come into our conversation unconsciously. And I did not want to hear that tone in my, in my language. 
I am wondering when did we lose when when will this moment that we lose us, uh, I was wondering when will this moment when we lose us ability of when we finally when Russian finally replaces Soviet in our minds when we forget Soviet actually Soviet language and now I see it actually coming back to our lives and it horrifies me on the lingual on the link from the lingual point of view we are being sucked back in and I, I'm not, I don't know where it goes but we'll live and see are you ready to take questions yes I yes uh, uh, any questions please um, thank you very much for the beautiful piece and for the conversation and I have a question uh, not asked about these public or official language, and I have a question about the private language. Um, and I would like to, I would, um, I would like you to explain uh, what exactly do you mean when you say private language? What grade of privateness? Is this um, private language for you, the language you speak, or one speaks with um, their friends and family? Or is this the language that you speak to yourself in your mind? Or, or something else, and <clears throat> and um, uh, do you think that it is um, uh, it is possible to have um, more than one private language in, in your mind? Thank you. Those are very good questions. I <laughs> I I think of the private language as the language I speak speak to myself, but in extension to my closest friends. And but I think even with people who are really close to you, there's always misunderstanding between two private languages. You know, I, I think that that it which is why I said loneliness, you know, we, we all feel a little lonely because what we really want to speak to the person you love or the two per to the person who matters the most to you is to have the two people converse in private language. But by definition, that private language is really what you speak to yourself. Sometimes it's not even written language. It could be images. I think people speak to themselves in images. It could be music notes. People speak to themselves in, uh, in tunes. But that is hard to have you know an exact conversation with with someone so so it is yeah so i i'm thinking of the private language as the language to speak to yourself but i think that's why on the other hand i do think that's why we read and write literature because you know if literature is written in public language nobody is going to read it and we're just going to get tired of reading these things but i think literature written in private language and if a reader can have some access, has some access to that language, and that's the communication that happens on the page, and any of that communication makes the world a better one. But not having that, so so yes, and can one have more than one private language? I th I think one can. I mean, I have my best friend is a musician and a writer. And I noticed when she writes, she, I mean, she has different personalities when she writes and when she plays music. She's this really skinny little American woman. And when she plays music, and she also plays music in the church for a living, people would come to her and say, wow, you're such a passionate you know, pianist or, uh, or you know, organist. Have you ever played for African American church? That's how she was. So she is so passionate. But when she writes, she writes in the most, uh, I would say, you know, accurate and distant way. But it's the most elegant and beautiful way. So I think she, she somehow she achieves two private languages in two different areas. Next, please. Yeah, over there. Hello, I am also from China, and um, I read I read some of your novels, and I think it's quite fluent and natural as a 
second language, um, I'm quite interested in the theme you choose. You uh, previously you said uh, you wanted to disown your native language, but some of the novels is that the vagrants, the story is set place in uh, China. So, what do you think that? Do you think that language and history, or, or uh, I put it this way, memory is segregated? Is alienated, and the second question is that is that uh, you uh, the way you arrange the story in English you sort it in English is this a collapse collapse is this a therapy a comfort for you? Yeah. Um, thank you. Okay. Thank you. That those are those are you know questions I have thought for ever and ever since I started writing. Right. So. I write about America, but I also write about China, and there's that innate, like internal conflict I find with, within myself, and I'm sure readers also find is how do you write about your mother country, not in your mother language, and are you distant or are you are you alienating anyone or any or any characters in that process? My understanding is, no, I don't think so. I think a story is a story. A good story should be told. It should be able. To, you should be able to tell a good story in any language. But I think what you also mentioned, it's it's interesting, is because if you write, say, if I write about China, and I write about the political situation in China, inevitably I run into the situation that I have to get the political translation into English. I don't want to do literary translation. I don't want to educate. I don't want to like educate my readers that this is China, this is, but that's the political situation. You still have to do a little bit of, you know, getting through to your readers. And that's, that's I, I think, you know, you cannot avoid that when you, when you write about the culture, but the same, but on the other hand, even if I write about America, I write about America from my perspective, from my point of view. And my point of view is a little bit different from other writers, maybe from writers with native language or from writers who have grown up in America. So again, there's that, that sort of like off angle. And I like that off angle. And I like to, I think if you use that angle, wisely it can become an advantage so so and your second question is does writing in english offer comfort yeah. <laughs> do you mean this this piece i especially read or in general in general in general yeah. you know i i have to i have to make one confession i think people here ask so many good questions yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i have to say these questions have never been asked of me. In America, usually people ask, why do you write in Chinese? <laughs> or why do you write in English? I think, you know, it does offer comfort. And, and it, again, I said, if I, I am honest, writing in English, I feel it's a salvation. It, it keeps me sane. It keeps me, you know, it gives me a space. I think all we do in life is to find a space for yourself. You know, some people find a space in the world by being, say, a successful businessman, by being, you know, a bullying American president. You know, people do all sorts of things to find space for themselves. And for me, I think I find that space by writing in English. And in that language, in that space, I feel not only comforted, I, I do feel like I exist in the way I want to. I, I, I have to tell that a few months ago, maybe almost a year ago, I was invited to a small Israeli independent radio station and I, um, as the conversation was about new Russian, new wave of Russian immigrants with its very interesting specific, etc., etc., and all the guests well, from, were from the Russian or Soviet descent, just like me. And we spoke, and the editor of this uh, uh, sh small show came to us at the end of it and said, You know, guys, 
that was truly amazing. And I'm not telling it because I'm trying to be nice. I'm telling it because it was so deep and profound and sincere. And the only problem, now I feel depressed. And then the girl who sat next to me proudly stood straight and said, that's because we are Russian. <laughs> so, welcome. <laughs> You're totally welcome. Next question, please. You're welcome. Yeah. It will be not such a wise question, but I would like to ask you about your work in uh, open space. Could you please tell something about that? Thank you. Yes, so, so this is the magazine I, I and uh, my best friend and I edit together in America. It's called A Public Space. So you hear when I say space, and, and, and A Public Space is, again, it's a magazine. We, ma we try to make a space for people or for writers, for writing we like to publish. Oh, is it public? It's a, it's a four issue a year, yeah. And it, it's a, I, I must say it's a, it's a labor of love because you never make money by <laughs> doing a literary magazine and you read so many, you know, story like people read, people send their, their submissions, I would say, you know, 500 in a month and we would read them. But the, the reason we, I really love doing this magazine and the reason I want to keep doing it is I once went to Los Angeles and I did a radio interview with one of the most important literary radio shows in America. And he said, he, what he said to me was important, what mattered to me why we do, would do this. He said, I open a lot of American literary magazines and I see the same names, all the big names. And he said, I open your magazine, there's always someone I don't, I've never heard of, and I like to read them, and they're good writers. And which is exactly, you know, why I do this, is I think what you, what you said is, you know, when you know someone's fame, or public, you know, status, you always look at the works, you are sort of, you know, different colored lens, right? So we try to, publish, you know, people who most people say would not have discovered or would not have heard of. You know, I, in the latest issue, I published actually a Russian writer, uh, a Korean writer writing in Russian in Central Europe, I mean Central Asia. I think it's, uh, I would say he lives in Kajikistan. Korean. His name is Alexander Han. I don't know. Yeah, and, and the reason I was interested is, you know, I was introduced. He, they, and someone introduced my, uh, me to his work. So his, his father was North Korean, and his mother was Russian, I think. And, and he was born in Pyongyang, and then they have to de deport. I guess he and his little sister and his mother were deported, and his father stayed in North Korea and never left. And so, I, what I the first thing I read from him was this talk. He talked about after so many years going back to North Korea to visit his father's grave because he had never seen his father. Right. So it was a quite it was a moving piece about you know just kneeling down to the father's grave and crying. And this is quite universal feeling of never seeing your father. And it's also quite, I would say, Asian, right? East Asian, that, that reunion by the graveside. So, so then we, we, we found some of his earlier work and we translated. And this is the kind of writer that you don't get to hear in America. And I think, and so we try to find writers like him. Like another example was this woman who was speaking of why Donald Trump got elected, right? There was a big population in America who was forgotten by the media, by, the, by a lot of people. And this woman had an interesting story. She was born in a coal miner's family along the Ohio River in a very impoverished area. And she was the fifth of the six children of Miner's family. And she had an education, but 
but you know, she stayed in the coal mine industry. First as a clerk, she worked for years as a clerk in the coal mines industry. And then she worked, so she still worked for the coal industry. And she taught herself to write. This was someone who never been to a, like a writing program, had no connection with the writing world. She taught herself to write. And when you read her work, one thing I always question is, oh, these are, you know, her characters are so real, but I also can see they are the people who have voted for Trump in the last election. It's so painful to see that. She was able to humanize these characters, but you also know Trump got elected upon these people's, you know, suffering. So, so I, I, I mean, I'm just giving you some examples of work that I don't think you would see in a lot of American magazines. This is fantastic. They try to imagine a liberal magazine that receives a story, a really good story, that actually humanizes people who sincerely voted for Putin. It's an interesting situation. It's, it's something to think about, at least. Um, any questions? Because I have two of my own if, if nobody else has, of course. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the reading and for the story. Uh, very simple question. What are your favorite Russian poets or writers? And what uh, translations uh, do you prefer, uh, English or Chinese one? Uh, <laughs> I, 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 it's silly to announce that I made, like, there was one picture of my War and Peace that went viral last year in America, because I, I read War and Peace once a year. And I marked so many things, and, and I'm a big fan of Tolstoy, but I also I'm a big fan of Chekhov. And these are you know, Asic Babel. I read Asic Babel. And what we were talking about, I think Masha and a few of us were talking about the literary heritage versus your you know national or ethnic heritage. And if you look at Asic Babel, for instance. He, in, he, in, he influenced a lot of writers in America. Hemingway claimed, you know, as a battle as his, as his writer teacher. And my mentor, James Ellen McPherson, who was the first African-American writer to have won the Pulitzer Prize in America, the first writer he introduced me was as a battle. And, and so, so these are the writers, these are the Russian writers I, you know, I read. And, I read English, and I used to read Chinese translation. Uh, Turgenev, I, I read Turgenev when I was young, quite young. And, but now I read English translation. And I, I think someone told me the translation is different. You know, probably the beauty is like quite diluted, which I think it's possible. <laughs> but I, 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 it's sad, I don't, I don't read Russian. <laughs> I started my day today talking to seven-year-olds, to a group of 16, seven-year-olds about Chekhov's story named Boys. And one of the amazing, and I, I do it from time to time, uh, I, I talk to children about literature and I'm always, it's, it's always a discovery. I'm always shocked and, and uh, set back from uh, the questions they ask. And one of the children, in one group I told that Chekhov was uh, suffering at the end of his life. He, has, uh, he had tuberculosis and he was suffering, etc., etc., and he was dying, and he was surrounded by his friends, and it, it was a difficult scene. And then one child, seven years old, raises his hand and asks, tell me please, if it was so difficult on everyone, why did, just didn't he shoot himself? <laughs> And that was a very difficult moment for me, so if, if you have an answer, please tell me later, because I, I'm stuck there. Um, so, yes, I, I can't answer it sincerely, but I just don't know, maybe it was a good idea, because that's called a, a propaganda of suicide among children, and that's, uh, that's illegal now. So. Well, I mean, I, I just, just a very quick an anecdote. I, when I taught Tegenev's first love to my 
children, you know, my children, my undergrad, these are 18, 19 year olds. It was so interesting to see, these are American kids who have, you know, watch American movies, who have, and they could just not wrap up their minds around this father and son loving the same woman. They were just like, they were blown away by the, the story. I thought, How many times have you heard about disgusting? I, oh, I, I just thought, wow, you know, you, you waste your life watching movies. <laughs> because this is the real, this, this is the real thing. Yeah, this is the real stuff. Anyone else, please? Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you so much, and I want to go back to the discussion about the languages. And my question is based on the recent movie called Arrival. And I think the main like point of this movie is that language is a gift. And every other language we learn is another gift for us, for our inner world. It enriches us, it gives us more opportunities, we understand more about the world. And what I wanted to ask is, do you think that you are a different person from the person that you were when you knew only Chinese? Do you think you're different from all those people who choose to live in their communities, even in America, but speak only their native language rather than like, discuss something with uh, native people of the country they live in? Thank you. Yes. You know, I don't think I am different from, I think the choice of language is a personal choice and and so I don't think I am different from people say, you know, people from Mexico, when they stay in the Mexican uh, communities, they would still use Spanish mostly and Chinese communities, they did heavily, you know, use Chinese, Mandarin Chinese or Cantonese. I don't think I am different from them and but I, I, I do, you know, when you say that, uh, language is a gift, I think that's, that's, the, that's the interesting thing is, I, I always want to say, you know, you, you, you want to be open to that gift. Sometimes people find it hard to be given something. People like to give, but being, being able to receive, that's, that's a real talent, I think. Not many people are talented at receiving a gift, so I think, I like what you said, language is a gift. And, and then, you know, the, the, this is a little aside, but then there are people who really decide not to talk. I have a friend who actually, whose child is a selective mute. She just decides she would not use language. And, and I, I think, I'm, I'm hugely fascinated by her, by this child, because she finds it hard. I think she finds language, certain aspects of language hard for her, so she decides to turn herself mute. And in that way, she actually is having a much more difficult life than a lot of children her age, because she, she does not take that one gift. But I think she's brave. That's what she decides to be. And, and she would write note to communicate, necessary communication, but mostly she stays silent. But I don't think she is, but I think her mind is active. She just doesn't communicate that active mind. I, um, I remember that you are an immunologist. I at some moment thought about the social body of, um, of some immigrant community reacting to the new culture in a way that probably, as far as I understand, our body gives an immune response mm -hmm. to, to foreign intrusion. Yeah. But if I understand correctly, this is how vaccinations work. Yes. Unless you let you, your body to go through it and somebody, something that's unpleasant, yes. you don't get to the, to the other side. That's so pro probably this is the situation. That's very true. I think I, I'm fascinated, you know, I love immune system, our immune system. We react to foreign bodies. It's almost like on every level, on our self level, on the society level, there's always something foreign we react to. Sometimes we exclude, we, you know, we fight against anything foreign. But vaccination, in, <laughs> inoculation is exactly invented for that reason. We want to include rather than exclude. And it seems to me that the important thing to remember is probably you can 
live without it and live a beautiful life without it. But it's about receiving gifts, as you said. Okay. Anyone else, please? Over there. First of all, thank you so much for the unforgettable lecture. It means a lot to me. And um, there's one simple but personal question I would like to ask you. Um, we talked about um, love for a language. And, um, well, do you remember the moment that you, when you fell in love with it, with English? And what was it? Was it a person or a book or a trip to America? And uh, do you remember the emotions that you uh, felt at that time? Thank you. Thank you. I, you know, I have a very early memory with English, but it was just a very small memory. My father spoke a little bit of English, and this was when I was three, and he was taking me for out for a walk, and it was a it was a ni nice na night with the moon, and he pointed to the moon. He said "moon" in English, and I that was the only English word I remember from my childhood. But it mattered to me. But I don't know. But I think the moment I knew for sure I fell in love with English was when I was in America. And you know, I, my whole story of becoming a writer was such a random story. I was actually an immunologist, and I was in in and it was in Iowa. The winter there, probably, it's not as long and as harsh as as Russian winter, but it was really cold and there was nothing to do, so I took a writing class, and... <laughs> that's, why, that's why we have so many writers, finally. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a cold winter. And it's actually a community writing class, which means, you know, a lot of people just went because it was cold. And so I took the class and I wrote my first story. It was a, even not a story, it was just a little episode about uh, about my experience in Chinese army, and and I realized I actually liked that experience because I described something that I never described in Chinese to myself. Was when we were in the army one time we went out. You know these were the army practice when you ha when you were given the blank thing, the blank bullets, but uh, didn't kill people in the blank, right? So we each were given ten blank to do this strategy work, whatever, the, the battle, the, the, the imitated battle. And afterward, everybody was required to report how many people you shot and killed. And everybody said, I killed 10. Everybody said that. It was such a, like, a game, but it was so cruel a game. And when I wrote that in English, I realized, well, you know, there are so many things that I've never described to myself or to anyone in, in, in Chinese, but I wrote that little episode in English and I really loved it. And it was an odd situation when you really described blissfully you killed 10 people in your imagination. <laughs> so that's, that's when I started falling in love with English language. And says, since now our time is out and we have to get out all depressed, I think that our goal is achieved. We are <laughs> Russian after all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you. Thank you so much. It was fantastic. And I hope that um, one day you'll come to Russia for the fun of it and not only for the difficult questions oh. and literary discussions. Thank you so much, and thank you, Kolta, for inviting us uh, uh, all to be here and for um, giving us this, this opportunity. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.